When white opens the game with the king pawn, if black is looking for a solid, challenging defense, a good reply is c6, turning the game into the Karo Khan, an opening which has been employed by several world champions and their grandmaster colleagues. This move prepares to confront white's central pawn with d5. Opening the game with c6 does not significantly help black's development, so white may focus on rapid development and try to build an initiative against black's solid setup. Since black is not directly challenging white's center for the moment, a sensible response is to grab more space in the center with d4. When black is ready to fight against white's center with d5, grabbing space in the center while challenging white's e4 pawn. White has a variety of choices, but we'll begin our exploration of the Karo Khan with one of white's most challenging, as well as natural responses, e5. White grabs space, clamping down on the f6 and d6 squares, restricting black's kingside knight and bishop from using these natural squares for development. An ambitious option to explore is c5, spending a second tempo on the c-pawn in order to attack the d4 pawn. Unlike the French defense, a similar opening in which black plays e6 on the first move to prepare d5. In the Karo Khan, black's light-squared bishop is not blocked by a pawn, so black's most popular choice is to play bishop f5. Activating the light-squared bishop before preparing to close the center with e6. We're going to introduce some interesting ideas explored by grandmasters, but when you're starting out with the Karo Khan, you may see a move such as bishop d3. This is not a particularly ambitious choice, but it is seen at amateur level from time to time. Since the Karo Khan often builds a light-squared pawn structure in the center, somewhat restricting the prospects of black's light-squared bishop, black shouldn't mind exchanging the bishops with bishop takes d3, queen takes d3. If black wants to simplify the game, then queen a5 check, intending to offer an exchange of queens with queen a6 is a reasonable path to explore. But another solid choice is to simply play e6. Black's idea is to strike against white center with moves such as c5 and knight c6 when black shouldn't face any serious problems out of the opening. Offering an exchange of light squared bishops is not a challenging option at this moment, so a more popular way to develop is knight f3. Focusing on kingside development while supporting the center. Now that the light squared bishop has entered the action, black can solidify the center with e6. The e6 pawn supports d5, while revealing the dark squared bishop, preparing the pawn breaks c5. A popular choice for white is to continue with bishop e2. This modest looking move is known as the short variation, named after Grandmaster Nigel Short. Although this may not look like a particularly ambitious choice, black should not underestimate this variation, as several creative attacking grandmasters have played this system as white. One option to consider is knight d7, preparing the thematic pawn breaks c5 but black may also decide to immediately play c5, striking in the center, adding pressure against d4, and preparing to activate the knight with knight c6. Move order can be quite important in the Karo Khan. Grandmaster Arcady Knightish, playing white, decided to castle. Of course, there is nothing wrong with this move, but his opponent, former world champion Vishwanathan Anand, was able to continue comfortably with knight c6, adding another attacker against the d4 pawn. If white decides to support the center with c3, one solid plan is knight g to e7, preparing to play bishop g4, pinning the knight on f3, followed by knight f5, when white's center is under intense pressure. In the game, Grandmaster Knightish played bishop e3, developing a piece while supporting the center, when Grandmaster Anand released the tension with the exchanges c takes d4, knight takes d4. White sets up a small trap, as black should not ignore white's serious lead in development and try to grab a pawn with knight takes e5. As this allows white to exploit black's exposed king and undeveloped kingside with bishop b5 check, encouraging black to move the knight once again with knight d7, which is well met by knight takes f5. Black is unable to capture the knight without giving up the d5 pawn, opening up the game, helping white's superior development overwhelm black's passive as well as underdeveloped position. Instead of the greedy knight takes e5, Grandmaster Anand exchanged a pair of minor pieces with knight takes d4, bishop takes d4. Black needs to activate the king side, and the e5 pawn still has a cramping effect by denying black's knight access to the f6 square. This was no problem for Anand as he played knight e7. Black's plan is simple, he's going to play knight c6, adding pressure against d4 and e5, 
followed by bishop e7 and castling kingside. Grandmaster Knightish tried to open the position before Black was able to comfortably complete his plan with c4. But Black simply resolved the central tension with d takes c4, bishop takes c4, and then continued the plan by playing knight c6, threatening White's bishop while adding pressure against the e5 pawn. So White pinned the knight with bishop b5. Black prepared kingside castling while developing the bishop to e7. In the game, White decided to play knight c3, allowing Black to castle with a comfortable position. Not only did Grandmaster Anand solve his opening problems, he went on to win the game. If White tried to discourage Black from castling with queen a4, adding a second attacker against the pin knight, Black can simply ignore White's idea and castle anyway. The point is that if White plays bishop takes c6, b takes c6, the c6 pawn cannot be captured as this would drop the bishop. And after rook d1, lining up with Black's queen, a simple solution is queen c7, connecting the rooks, supporting c6, as well as adding pressure against the e5 pawn, Black enjoys the bishop pair with a comfortable game. Rather than castling, White may decide to immediately support the center with bishop e3, protecting the d4 pawn while adding additional pressure against the c5 pawn. This is a position debated at grandmaster level, especially with Black's most ambitious response, queen b6. Increasing the tension in the center while adding pressure against the newly unprotected b2 pawn. We can see the dynamic potential of the short variation come to life with knight c3. White focuses on rapid development while inviting black to capture the b2 pawn. Accepting the pawn is a risky decision as queen takes b2. Is well met by the surprising queen b1. If black captures white's knight with check, white is prepared to play bishop d2 attacking the queen, followed by queen takes b7, attacking the unprotected rook on a8. If black decides to trade queens with queen takes b1 check, rook takes b1, white enjoys a significant lead in development while the b7 and c5 pawns are both under serious pressure. Grandmaster Pavel Elianov, playing black, tried to resolve some of the tension with c4. Closing the center but allowing his opponent, former world championship challenger Sergei Karyakin, to regain the pawn with rook takes b7. When white was able to turn this active position into a fine victory. Since queen takes b2 allows white the type of active chances the short variation tries to produce, a more reliable option for black is to play knight c6. Continuing to intensify the central struggle, one popular option to explore is kingside castling. But it's also important to understand what happens if white decides to relieve the central tension with d takes c5. Bishop takes c5. It looks like white is simply helping black catch up in development, but this is not a charitable act. White has a specific idea in mind after trading bishops with bishop takes c5. Queen takes c5. Thanks to exchanging the dark squared bishops, in one grandmaster encounter, Hikaru Nakamura played knight b5 threatening both knight c7 and knight d6 check. So his opponent, Grandmaster Shakriar Mamadarov, played the prophylactic king f8. Black's king is immune from any annoying knight checks, and knight d6 would not be a wise decision, as the e5 pawn would come under serious pressure, and with it, the knight on d6 would become quite unstable. White will favor centralizing the knight with knight b to d4, followed by kingside castling. White enjoys a central space advantage, although this is still double-edged as it will serve as a target for black. Meanwhile, black will likely continue with knight g to e7, and one idea is to expand on the kingside light squares with h5 and g6, taking space and preparing to move the king to g7. Since the center remains closed, black's king should not face any immediate problems. Slightly strange looking, but ultimately solid positions can be the price of admission for prospective defenders of the Karo Khan. As is typical in the Karo Khan, there is plenty of play available for both sides, and in this particular game, Grandmaster Nakamura managed to bring home the full point for white. Knight f3 is an interesting choice that is not without its poison, but a more aggressive choice that has also attracted Grandmaster attention is h4. This may look like a beginner's move, but it's actually a serious try to gain an advantage against the Karo Khan. It has been tried at no less a stage than a world championship match and is regularly employed by grandmasters. White grabs more space on the king side and prevents black's natural continuation e6. This would be a serious mistake as white can win a piece after g4. 
The light squared bishop can try to run with bishop e4, but it certainly can't hide after f3, forcing the retreat bishop g6. When white marches forward with h5, trapping the bishop so white simply wins a piece. Instead of blundering with e6, black can play h6, allowing white to build a space advantage on the king side with g4 and h5. A more solid choice is to stop the h-pawn in its tracks with h5. One popular option for white is to play bishop d3, and another sensible choice is to add pressure against black's center, starting with c4. Now that g4 is no longer a threat, black can return to the typical response e6, supporting the center while preparing kingside development. White may increase the pressure against d5 and develop another piece with knight c3. Black has an important choice to make. If black decides to centralize a knight with knight d7, adding pressure against e5 and hoping to support a future c5 pawn break, this allows white to play c takes d5, forcing black to recapture on d5 with a pawn, followed by bishop g5. Although there is nothing wrong with this approach, a more flexible choice is knight e7, preparing to respond to a possible c takes d5 with knight takes d5, opening up the d-file when the d4 pawn may come under future pressure. Although h5 is black's most reliable option, it does weaken the g5 square, and the h5 pawn itself may become a target. One way to emphasize these points is to play knight g to e2. Black can continue to focus on development while supporting the center with knight d7, preparing to meet knight g3, adding pressure against both the h5 pawn and light squared bishop by addressing both of these points with bishop g6, reinforcing the h5 pawn. The dark squared bishop can enter the action by exploiting the weak g5 square, pinning the e7 knight to the queen. When white activates the dark squared bishop, black should consider the possibility of queen b6, adding pressure against the center as well as the space the dark squared bishop left behind, the b2 pawn. White can explore sacrificing the b2 pawn with the sharp rook c1, or else keep more control of the position with queen d2 centralizing the queen while supporting the b2 pawn. A challenging idea for black is to play d takes c4, opening up lines on the d-file, preparing to meet bishop takes c4, with queenside castling. We have reached a very sharp position typical of the h4 advance variation. White enjoys a space advantage with more active pieces, but black has pressure on the d-file, especially keeping in mind white's vulnerable d4 pawn. White may decide to castle queenside, but another plan is to gain a tempo against black's queen with knight a4, followed by adding pressure down the c-file with rook c1, provoking interesting complications with no shortage of interesting play for both sides. Advancing the pawn to e5 is a serious way to test the Karo Khan. A less critical, but still important option is to simply exchange pawns with e takes d5, c takes d5. As we learned in the advanced variation, black typically wants to activate the light squared bishop before playing e6. In one high level encounter, former world champion Bobby Fischer, playing white in this exchange variation, decided to challenge this idea with bishop d3. Developing the bishop to an active diagonal and depriving black's light squared bishop of the desirable f5 square. His opponent, former world champion Tigran Petrosian responded with the sensible knight c6 adding pressure against the d4 pawn. If white decides to defend the pawn with knight f3, this allows black to activate the light squared bishop with bishop g4, pinning the knight to the queen. So Bobby decided to play c3, reinforcing the center. Petrosian continued with knight f6, making a natural developing move and waiting to see how white will continue. Fisher actively developed the dark squared bishop with bishop f4. We usually see knights quickly entering the game, but this unusual bishops before knight strategy makes it more difficult for black to comfortably develop the light squared bishop. One interesting idea is to play g6, intending bishop f5, allowing white to double black's pawns on the f-file with bishop takes f5, g takes f5. Black is willing to accept this pawn structure in exchange for strong control over the light squares. Grandmaster Petrosian decided to activate his light squared bishop immediately with bishop g4, attacking white's queen. Now that black has activated the light squared bishop, the b7 pawn is no longer protected, so white responded with queen b3, adding pressure against black's center as well as the newly unprotected b7 pawn. 
Petrosian wasn't comfortable with the placement of White's queen and decided to play knight a5. Disturbing White's queen as well as protecting the b7 pawn at the expense of misplacing Black's knight on the edge of the board. Before retreating the queen, Fisher first inserted the useful move queen a4 check, provoking Black to retreat the bishop with bishop d7. Now that the bishop has retreated, Bobby moved his queen to c2. After this maneuvering dance, White has a comfortable position, and although Black is certainly doing okay, his light-squared bishop is less active than Black would like, and the wayward knight on a5 will also have to spend time to return to the action. Grandmaster Fisher went on to win this important game on his path to qualify for the World Championship match which he would also eventually win. Instead of playing Grandmaster Petrosian's knight a5, a more stable choice is to play queen d7, simply developing the queen while protecting the b7 pawn. White would like to play knight f3 without allowing structural damage after bishop takes f3, so a sensible choice is to first play knight d2. Black supports the center and prepares to complete kingside development with e6, when white is ready to play knight g to f3, creating the possibility of an unpleasant knight advance to e5, so former world championship challenger Fabiano Caruana played bishop d6, protecting the e5 square, preparing to castle, and offering an exchange of dark squared bishops. His opponent, Grandmaster Levon Aronian, accepted this offer with bishop takes d6, queen takes d6. Exchanging the dark squared bishops involves a potential pawn sacrifice, allowing white to play queen takes b7. Of course, white does not have to accept this sacrifice and may decide to castle, following the simple, safety-first attitude of the exchange variation. But Grandmaster Aronian challenged black to prove compensation after queen takes b7. Although white has captured a pawn, this does open up the b-file, allowing black to generate counterplay with rook b8 forcing the queen to vacate the b-file with queen a6, when black secured the back rank by castling. Black may be down a pawn but enjoys a lead in development with an active position. He's prepared to gain a tempo against the queen with rook b6, followed by doubling rooks with rook f to b8, creating serious pressure down the b-file. Black has full compensation for the pawn, and even managed to win the game after some interesting adventures. Do not let an early exchange on d5 fool you. Instead of the less ambitious, although perfectly reasonable bishop d3, white can turn the game into the more dynamic Panov attack with c4, placing immediate pressure against d5. White is willing to accept an isolated queen's pawn position in order to generate active play. Black's most common response is to support the center with knight f6. The central struggle continues with knight c3. Black has three main ways to deal with this position. If you're looking for a straightforward as well as solid reply, then e6, preparing to complete development modestly with bishop e7, followed by kingside castling is worth exploring. And the interested viewer is also encouraged to check out lines where black plays bishop b4, adding a Nimzo Indian flavor to the position. If black wants to sharpen play, g6, preparing a kingside fiend keto to add pressure down the long diagonal, especially the d4 pawn, is also worthy of serious attention. Black's other main choice is to immediately add pressure against white center with the sensible developing move, knight c6. If white wants to keep the position complicated, then the dynamic bishop g5, attacking a key defender of black center, is definitely worth exploring. Black can provoke sharp complications with d takes c4, revealing the queen's pressure against white's newly isolated d4 pawn. When in doubt, e6 is certainly a solid choice. In the slightly strange-looking bishop e6, supporting the center, has also proven to be a reliable option for black. Another popular option for white is to simply develop while supporting the center with knight f3. Black could certainly return to the e6 lines we previously mentioned, but Grandmaster Anish Giri played the more active bishop g4, pinning the knight to the queen, which indirectly adds pressure against the d4 pawn it was trying to support. Legendary Grandmaster Vasily Ivanchuk, playing white, showcases one key strategy in the Panov, compromising his pawn structure in order to test black's defensive skills. The complications begin with c takes d5, provoking knight takes d5. White attracts the knight to the d5 square, and then plays the double attack queen b3, increasing pressure against the knight as well as the b7 pawn. Grandmaster Geary was able to damage white's pawn structure with the timely exchange bishop takes f3. 
immediately playing queen b7 would allow the powerful response knight d to b4, when white's exposed queen and vulnerable king signals trouble for white. Ivanchuk continued with g takes f3. White's pawn structure has certainly seen better days, but black still needs to be careful. Like many other lines in the Karo Khan, since black often delays king's side development, king's safety must be kept in mind. If black tries to grab a pawn with knight takes d4, forking the queen an unprotected f3 pawn, there are several ways to punish this move, but the most straightforward is bishop b5 check. Capturing the knight would allow queen takes b5 check, followed by winning the knight on d5. And if black blocks the check with knight c6, this also loses the knight on d5 without any chances for counterplay. Rather than playing the disastrous knight takes d4, Grandmaster Geary supported his center and prepared kingside development with e6. If black is able to comfortably complete development, then white's terrible pawn structure may prove to be his downfall, so white must play energetically, as Ivanchuk did with queen takes b7, capturing a pawn while attacking the newly undefended knight on c6 so black responded with knight takes d4, provoking the forcing sequence bishop b5 check, knight takes b5. It's important for white not to play automatically, as queen takes b5 allows queen d7, so Ivanchuk inserted the instructive Zvishenzug, queen c6 check. Since queen d7 would lose the rook on a8, black is forced to play king e7. Only after depriving black of the right to castle did white regain material with queen takes b5. Grandmaster Geary offered a trade of queens with queen d7. Although black's king doesn't look especially healthy on e7, it isn't so easy for white to directly exploit it. If allowed, black may consider f6 and king f7, improving the king's position and also liberating the dark-squared bishop. Ivanchuk decided to exchange knights followed by bishop g5 check leading to simplifications, ultimately resulting in a draw. Although Grandmaster Practice has demonstrated with proper play black should be able to equalize against the Panov, there are many pitfalls to avoid in order to reach such a position. This is certainly an interesting attempt to take a Karo Khan player out of their comfort zone, so this variation will typically reward the better prepared and more experienced player. We have spent most of our time focusing on white responding to d5 by moving the e4 pawn but it's also important to consider the natural response knight c3. Simply developing a piece and supporting the center. When white defends the center with a knight, black typically exchanges pawns with d takes e4. Knight takes e4. Although the knight enjoys a centralized position, it's vulnerable to attack, so it's no surprise that black's main ideas focus on attacking this piece. One sideline option is knight f6, Confronting white's knight, willing to accept doubled f-pawns as a consequence. This is a line that has enjoyed renewed interest at grandmaster level and should not be underestimated. A more stable way to prepare knight f6 is by first playing knight d7. Known as the Smyslov variation, black is preparing knight g to f6 without compromising the pawn structure. As beginners we may be taught the trap queen e2, threatening a smothered mate with knight d6. But as long as black doesn't automatically play knight g to f6, white's queen will likely prove misplaced. There is nothing wrong with straightforward development with knight f3, intending bishop c4. But if you're interested in learning more about the Smyslov variation, it's also important to study the lines after white's most ambitious response, knight g5. A good place to start is with knight g to f6, when one developmental plan to consider is e6 and bishop d6. It's important to note that if black challenges white's ambitious knight with h6, hoping white will play the unsound sacrifice knight takes f7, or simply retreat, black will be in for an unpleasant surprise after knight e6. The surprising knight lunge is immune from capture, because f takes e6 allows queen h5, leading to checkmate. Black should probably settle for queen b6, when white can gain the bishop pair with the promising knight takes f8. But if black decides to play more aggressively with queen a5 check, provoking bishop d2, in order to add pressure against the d4 and b2 pawns with queen b6, now that the d8 square is no longer occupied by the queen, it appears f takes e6 as a threat, but white may calmly respond with bishop d3. White enjoys an excellent position with a tremendous lead in development. The queen is tied down to the c7 square, and if black makes the mistake of playing f takes e6, 
This allows the instructive tactic, queen h5 check, forcing king d8. White's queen is perfectly placed to support the deadly pin, bishop a5, when black loses the queen. The subtle Smyslov system with knight d7 is definitely worth considering, but black's most popular option is to play the classical variation with bishop f5. Following black's general plan of activating the light-squared bishop before committing to a solid pawn structure with e6, white typically retreats the knight and gains a tempo against the bishop with knight g3. When black maintains the bishop's presence on this active diagonal with bishop g6, knight f3 is a natural developing move, but black's bishop on g6 remains stable, so if white decides to play bishop d3, black is not obligated to capture this bishop, as black can always respond to an exchange on g6, with h takes g6, opening up the h-file for black's rook, with a healthy position for black. This is why white's main line is to play the provocative h4, threatening to trap the bishop with h5. In this case, black should avoid committing to h5. This may look like a stable choice, but one issue black needs to contend with is the maneuver knight h3 to f4, attacking the bishop in h5 pawn. h5 weakens the g5 square, so white may also consider the plan knight f3, preparing to trade bishops with bishop d3. And once the light squared bishop no longer protects f7, white is ready to play knight g5, intensifying the pressure against the f7 pawn. Since h5 leads to positional problems, black usually responds with h6, creating an escape square for the bishop on h7 without weakening the g5 square. Although there is nothing wrong with playing h5 immediately, white usually inserts the move knight f3, eyeing the e5 square, so black can develop and fight for control of this square with knight d7, when white continues the plan of kingside expansion with h5, gaining another tempo against the bishop, which retreats to the newly opened h7 square. Now that black's light-squared bishop is no longer in a stable position, white offers an exchange of bishops with bishop d3. Allowing white to capture the bishop on h7 is not a desirable prospect, so black typically exchanges bishops with bishop takes d3. Queen takes d3. White increases the lead in development, a typical theme for white in the Karo Khan. After resolving the issues with the light-squared bishop, black can commit to the solid light-squared structure with e6. Placing pawns on e6 and c6, restraining white central d4 pawn, creating a typical rock-solid Karo Khan structure that is difficult to break down. Black is ready to continue with knight g to f6 and bishop e7, waiting to see how white may continue. Although black may remain flexible with where to commit the king, White's pawn on h5 makes it fairly clear that white will intend on castling queenside, emphasizing central and kingside pressure against black's structure. White's main decision is where to develop the dark-squared bishop, typically deciding between the d2 and f4 squares, options the interested viewer is encouraged to explore. We'll briefly mention that bishop f4 is the more active-looking square for the bishop. Black may continue sensibly with knight g to f6 and bishop e7 and provoke complications by castling kingside, but black may also decide to play queen a5 check, trying to provoke weaknesses on the side of the board where white will likely castle. So a common reply is bishop d2, allowing black's queen to move to c7, controlling the h2 to b8 diagonal. If white decides to play bishop d2 instead of bishop f4 immediately, we can transpose into this position by playing queen c7, or else remain flexible with knight g to f6, followed by bishop e7. As we can see, there are no shortage of interesting possibilities to explore in the Karo Khan. In this classical variation of the Karo Khan, white enjoys a space advantage with more room to maneuver the pieces, but black's rock-solid structure has typically sustained any pressure white has been able to place upon it, so this has been a reliable battleground in grandmaster practice for decades. The Karo Khan is one of the most solid ways to respond to e4. This is not an easy opening to crack, so in addition to producing positional maneuvering games, if both sides are willing, there is plenty of scope to inject dynamic play into the position. In order to build a solid structure, black often grants white a space advantage as well as a lead in development. So if you're facing the Karo Khan, you may look to build an early initiative. Grandmasters enjoy its solidity, as well as the ability to mix things up when necessary to play for a win. And if you're an amateur player looking for a reliable structure upon which to build your repertoire, the Karo Khan may be the opening for you.